Good afternoon and welcome to the Dairy Team webinar series. Today's program is on harvesting the first cutting of alfalfa right and making the most of your alfalfa season. Uh, we're delighted to have longtime extension agronomist Joel DeYoung with us to present. Uh, I almost thought maybe I'd start out saying the Grand Master here in uh, Iowa, but I don't know if that has the right connotation. But uh, we appreciate his outlook for the 2021 alfalfa crop and uh, how to review the stands, fertilizer, pest threats, and then also on using the peak. And I'll let him describe what that is. Uh, as you uh, look at uh, uh, this, the screen, you can see that uh, the program will be archived for later viewing at our Dairy Team website under webinars. Uh, we'd ask you to uh, mute your microphones and turn off your cameras. Uh, to ask questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Uh, and then uh, at the uh, end of the program, we'll have uh, uh, the uh, questionnaire in the chat box for you. So I've turned my uh, screen off. Uh, Joel, if you'll go ahead and load your screen, we should be able to to have you. So how does that look? Go to the display mode and then it mm. looks great. There she goes. Looks yep. okay on yours? Nope, you've got the notes page up. All right, we'll get that changed. That better. Yep, sure is. Perfect. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I am Joel DeYoung. I'm an extension agronomist for nine counties in, in Northwest Iowa. Uh, been the extension agronomist in this region since, oh, I shouldn't admit it, 1992. Been with extension since late 1981. So you do the math how wrong this old codger's been around. But uh, uh, it's Northwest Iowa, a lot of corn and soybeans in this part of the country. Uh, but yet we have quite a few dairies a lot of beef cattle. So we still have alpha alpha production and I'm gonna concentrate on alpha alpha production. Uh, not so much the mixed situation, but mostly alpha alpha production. Um, appreciate lots of other people for information uh, that I quote unquote borrowed. You're gonna hear some observations that I've seen over the years, uh, things uh, that I've seen this spring uh, as, we, as we talk today, but uh, lots of information. Hopefully there's a few tidbits in there that you can find and use and put into place in your operation. Uh, agenda, topics I'm gonna hit today. Uh, when I started making this list, knowing that it's about a 45 minute presentation or so, uh, my list was about two pages long and it's down to about one, which is still probably more than what we need. Uh, but we're gonna kind of try to go through the year of the different things that are out there. So this is my agenda topics. I'm gonna hit some a little more in depth some fairly rapidly as I move through them, uh, but uh, uh, that's what we're gonna hit for the day and, and that's kind of the order. I'm gonna start with overwintering. Uh, it's a time of year when we're trying to determine, do we have enough alfalfa plants out there? Uh, are we gonna have success this season, assuming that we're gonna get some rainfall to go with it? And that question, a lot of that actually started last fall, how we managed last fall. And we see a lot of differences. I borrowed these pictures from um, uh, Brian Lang, who was my counterpart that recently retired from Northeast Iowa in extension. Uh, Brian had a, a, a great collection of information for us. Most of his graduate work was actually focusing on alfalfa production. So uh, I relied on him heavily over the years of figuring out what we really want to talk about. And, uh, and of course, borrowed some of his slides. He was a much better photographer than I was. So I, I borrowed quite a few few of his slides too. But uh, looking at early in the spring, this is 2016, and, and, and we have a lot of slopes in Northwest Iowa also. So that's kind of a typical look that we see here. You know, you get your south facing slopes that green up nice and early. And if you're trying to make a decision, are we going to keep that alfalfa stand? Do we need to actually get a new alfalfa stand established? We need to do that at this stage of the game. 
So we can be very timely in establishing that new stand that we need to replace it with. Uh, so we're looking very early. Uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, some snowdrift insulation effect will give us a chance to regrow earlier. Uh, what we did the previous fall makes a world of difference. Is this a north slope? Is this a south facing slope? That all makes a difference in how rapidly it greens up. You know, and, and often early April isn't the time frame I like to look the most. I like to postpone it as long as I can. But in many times that first couple of weeks of April is when we want to get that new seeding in the ground. And I'm not going to talk much today about getting that new seeding established or variety selection, but that process needs to really start here if we need to put some new acres in. And of course, how we treated it makes a world of difference. So in the fall, I get lots of phone calls about, hey, when do you make that decision? When you make that last cut? And in, for Northern Iowa, my general advice is September 10th. And after that, you're putting additional risk onto that crop for the next year if you want to maintain it into the next year. If you don't care about the next year, I don't care. Uh, but if you truly want to try to help make sure we've got some uh, ability to increase the risk, uh, increase the chance we're going to get it back, that's important. But that's not the only factor. And that's why I like this little publication from Wisconsin, uh, evaluating and managing alfalfa stands for winter injury. It actually goes through the steps kind of nicely that helps you determine what you've got in practices, what your stand age is, what varieties you've got out there, what traits it has. Uh, we've been managing soil pH well or not. Of course, our P and K level, particularly potash level in that field. Uh, do we go into the year, the, the winter with a lot of moisture, a lot of a really wet fall increases the risk for having winter injury. So that's part of the mix. Um, how did we schedule? How do we harvest? What pressure do we put on it during the season last year? And when, when did we quit? Plus, how much fall stubble do we have left? So it's a really good publication. Two or three things that I will note that differ for Iowa. Uh, Wisconsin, for the most part, is a little north of here. So where they say September 1st, I say September 10th. Where they say October 15th, I'm going to say October 20th for Northern Iowa. And on that slide, you can also see the, the changes for the suggestions for Southern Iowa. Also, Wisconsin uses a, a Bray potassium test. Uh, Iowa State doesn't find as good a calibration with that. So we use a malic 3 or ammonium acetate test is what we recommend. And of course, that index is going to be a little different. So our optimum is 161 to 200. So if you're going to use this to make some uh, determinations, what kind of risk we're putting on next season, I would encourage you to look at those numbers. A note for everybody, uh, you'll see my email address at the end. If you want a copy of all these slides, which will have lots of data and other things on it, send me an email. I'll be glad to share that with you, and, and we'll send you a PDF version of every one of these slides if you want to review it again later. Uh, one of those things that's easy to be done, all you need to do is ask. So that tells me the risk going into the winter. The other consideration we have is we know that years where that soil temperature, where that crown's at, when it gets really cold, gives us additional risk. Uh, there's some data that indicates that those really high risk years are years where that four inch soil temperature uh, gets into that five to 15 degree temperature range. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Iowa State University has uh, called the ISU Soil Moisture Network across the state. And these are weather stations that not only measure temperature, rainfall, wind speed, wind direction, all those things. Uh, these weather stations also have a four inch soil temperature gauge under bare soil. And on this chart, you can see that they also have 12 inch, 24 inch and 50 inch temperature gauges. So you can see what it is to depth and you can watch that throughout the whole, the whole year if you wish. Uh, not only do they have those sensors, there's also moisture sensors at those depths, but I'm not going to go into that here. I just picked out a time series for the Northwest Research Farm. It's just the one I work with the most. And if you take a look at the four inch depth temperature gauge from first of the year through most of the month of March, you'll see that the low we got was with a really cold spell we had in this part of the state that occurred during the month of February. And we saw that four inch soil temperature depth get down into the low 20 degrees range. Now the risk area again is five to 15. So as I was looking at spraying, I didn't think we were gonna have huge winter kill, 
Um, that's not the only factor that causes winter kill, but that's one of those that can cause a lot of widespread winter kill if we have a significant time period in that really cold temperature range during that time of year. So expected some this year, didn't expect a real serious situation. Uh, that's what we saw at the Northwest Research Farm site. There's also one in Nashua, Northeast Iowa, uh, Northwest site. We actually, fortunately, even though we got 30 below temperatures, uh, we had some snow cover and snow cover, of course, is some insulation. So it kept it from peaking much lower than that. Whoops, pardon me. Uh, Northeast Iowa, Nashua Research Farm also has a weather station. Their peak low was down to 25. That occurred during the month of January. Uh, so you can kind of see what those temperatures have done at that zone. So going into the season, based on those numbers, I didn't expect huge amounts of winter kill that came with it. There's always some issues, particularly with older stands that maybe have had some uh, management challenges that go with it. Uh, but we didn't expect widespread damage based on this. We always have issues that deal with uh, ice sheeting. If we get some water standing at the bottom of the hills that, that snow melts or we get some rainfall and then we freeze it. Uh, we do know that some of those alfalfa, alfalfa plants give off some gases. Those gases, when they're trapped, can become toxic so that ice sheeting can cause a problem. Again, not taking that last cutting or leaving eight inches or so of growth not only puts energy back into the root system, it's got those little stems that stick up above the ice in most cases, allow some exchange of those, the, those gases, reduce the amount of ice sheeting that can occur where areas where water sat. So that's always another issue that we need to evaluate when we're looking at alfalfa stands uh, in the spring. Most of you have probably seen Iowa State's recommendations on how many crowns per square foot you need. Uh, that's the table. It comes from the Iowa State publication evaluating hay and pasture stands for winter injury. Uh, you've got the good category per square foot the year after seeding. I want at least 12, 12 crowns if I can of healthy crowns per square foot. Uh, the second year after seeding, we want at least eight. It becomes marginal with that number in the middle category. Uh, third year, fourth year, not only am I looking at how many crowns we've got, I really want to dig some areas and really split those crowns and take a look how much real damage. And if we've got more than 50% of that crown damage with, with injury, with disease, with physical injury that occurred during harvest, uh, we kind of discount some of those. And we, and we really, if we've got a high percentage or more than 50% of the plants with significant crown rot, even though you've got crowns that are growing, uh, we really want to discount those stands carefully. So what's that look like? Well, again, I borrowed this slide from, from Brian Lang uh, from his archives. Um, I like his square foot. He took some old uh, uh, yardsticks and he cut them down to and, and made a one foot square yardstick. I always used wire and when I would throw them, I'd randomly throw them to find a square foot. I sometimes had trouble finding the wire. So I kind of like these, these are more visible. So if you're throwing to come up with random one foot square areas to look. On the top, you've got one field where you went to that one foot square area, you dug up every crown in that area. Uh, obviously compared to the one in the bottom, it's regrowth wasn't as aggressive. It's management was different. And so it's response was a little different. You dug those crowns and you looked at them individually. You can see that there's only about one, two, three, four out there. Now, I, my understanding is this is about a four or five year stand. Uh, so it's getting later in its lifespan. So we're kind of marginal on crown counts to begin with. The second thing you wanna look at is when you split those crowns, what's the color? And you see a couple of them with a really nice white color. Uh, the one on the bottom left, you see more than 50% of that crown actually damaged from, from root rot, that kind of a problem. Uh, we get more than 50%. That's not a good indicator for a plant. A healthy one actually is fairly round. It's got uniform growth. Uh, it's about the same size across the whole crown. Uh, if we had some bud damage and it's still alive, those buds will be much smaller. It tells me we've also got a crown that's under stress. And so we kind of use some of that information to, to kind of adjust those stand counts based on the, the injury that we're seeing in the middle of those plants. That field that you saw earlier on the bottom, you split those crowns, crowns have a really nice white to a creamy white color. 
Uh, you don't see the brown damage nearly as significantly. Uh, you see more crowns. You see the fact that the growth is more uniform on most of those plants, although not everyone. The one on the right side is actually is kind of lopsided yet. Uh, but if they're really healthy plants, they're going to be kind of full. They're going to be looking really good. So that's one of the ways we evaluate that stand early. I truthfully like to wait a while if I can, uh, you know, to, to really see what we have for potential. Uh, Wisconsin data would indicate um, ideally we want 55 stems or more per square foot on average. And so I, this year, right now, you can go out there on a square foot in almost the entire state. You can count stems and you can find out if you're at 55 stems or more per, per square foot. And if you are, we're in really pretty good shape and our potential exists as long as those crowns are healthy to really do well this season. I was in about 230 acres of alfalfa yesterday. Uh, part of that field actually was close to probably 50, 45, 50 crowns. Uh, pardon me, stems per square foot. Uh, but when we started looking at crowns, we had damage on probably 75% of those crowns. So we're probably going to get a good first cutting. But after that, I had real concerns for that stand. However, if you've got healthy crowns or pretty healthy crowns and we've got 55 stems or better, we're set off to actually yield pretty well this year. If we're at 40 to 40, 40 to 55, we're kind of in that, we expect some yield reduction and we have some risk. We're assuming, of course, that those crowns are still healthy. And we, in most cases, could easily keep that stand uh, and reduce that, re take some reduced yield. Uh, of course, it depends on your situation. But if we're under 40 stems per square foot, or if we got a lot of square feet where there's a lot of ground showing, uh, you know, it, it might be time to move that stand on and, and find an alternative for that situation. The timely thing that's occurring right now. Um, this morning, in my part of the world, we were in the mid-teens for temperature. Uh, that's not where we wanted to be. That's the temperature map from, uh, from today. Uh, the high of yesterday, uh, the, the low we saw last night in the northwest corner, we had in the teens. The northern, most of the state were in the 20s. Uh, and, and it creates some potential injury from the tissue that's out there. I took this picture yesterday morning. Uh, this is the third day in a row we've been in at least the 20s for temperatures. Uh, this alfalfa stand, this is the third year of a stand. This is uh, near Lamar's. You'll see my uh, uh, yardstick says it's about five inch tall alfalfa. I was taken at eight in the morning and obviously you can see some pretty good uh, frost injury on it. Do we expect to lose those plants even with 16 degree temperatures this morning? I don't expect to lose those plants. They've got some uh, insulation just because there's a decent plant stand out there. We're going to see some damage to that tissue in the top. It's going to be three to five days before we really see how much top damage we have. But the question I'll often get is, if we have that much damage, what should we do next? In my book, um, and this, is, this again is information I've, I've borrowed from others. Uh, Dan Andersander from Wisconsin is where this written part came from, but it's a philosophy that I've observed over the years that I kind of like. Uh, if less than 30% of the stem tops show wilting from frost, don't do anything. And I'll throw in a second one there, and that's number two. If most or all stems are damaged and the stand is less than 10 inches tall, don't do anything either. Mowing it, I always get that question, should I mow it? Well, if you've got over 12 inches of tall, it's probably, it, you might want to just harvest that and, and, and take it and let it regrow. Put stress in the stand, of course, but you might as well take advantage of the damaged tissue and get something out of it. But uh, most in this northern half of the state's not likely going to be 12 inches tall. Uh, we maybe killed some of the growing point at the top of those plants. But remember, like soybeans and other plants, we have alternate buds at the base of every leaf. I tried to get a picture of that, but I'm a lousy photographer, so I couldn't show you that. But uh, almost all those leaves below that, if they're not damaged lower in the plant, you're going to see new growth come from those alternate buds. Now, it's not pointing straight up, so you might see some horizontal growth, but ultimately it will kind of go up and we will, it, it sets you back, there's no doubt about it. But we will have that growth return. Uh, I've never really seen a situation, we've had alfalfa this tall where we've gotten a frost, where it froze it all the way to the ground, 
and we damaged all the tissue above the crown, uh, you know, then we're going to have to watch a little bit to make sure we're regrowing from the crown. And then we reevaluate re what our stand is. But I don't suspect that's going to happen, even with mid teen temperatures. I think we're going to damage above ground tissue. We're going to slow down that first cutting, probably hurt our tonnage a little bit on that first cutting. Uh, but that's what I expect to see based on the temperatures we've had the last few nights. All right. As I watch producers, um, one of the big things for the, the guys that are getting the best yields, uh, they're paying attention to soil fertility. They're paying attention to removal rates. They're paying attention to the details all the way through. Uh, but soil fertility is a big one. And um, I think people forget sometimes uh, how much fertility is taken off that field when we harvest a ton of, of forage. And Iowa State's publication, PM 1688, a general guide for crop nutrient and limestone recommendations in Iowa. Magnificent reference piece. I encourage everybody to have one. It's only a dozen pages, read them all. Uh, you know, if you're growing corn and soybeans and alfalfa, read them all, there's, there's great information. Read it more than once because there's some really good information in there that can give us some help. When I'm working with producers and soil fertility, uh, I like to start with the cost of doing business. And that's how much we're removing annually. And table two in that publication helps give you guidance for how much you're taking off that field and how much is physically leaving the field when you harvest a crop. And so if you take a look at the alfalfa, the alfalfa grass line, uh, this is adjusted to 15% moisture per ton. It's not dry matter. When we revised this about four or five years ago, we moved it to 15% moisture is the standard and we adjust it to 15% when we're figuring out yield. But you take that number for every ton of 15% moisture alfalfa removed, we're taking off 13 pounds of phosphate, 43 pounds of potash. That adds up. And uh, you know, if you had a seven ton alfalfa, if you truly grew on seven ton alfalfa out there, you're taking about 300 pounds of potash off there. And I'm not sure everybody remembers or pays attention to how much potash that is out there. And my observation is the guys that look closely and manage that are the ones that have a tendency to keep their yields near the top end. I also think it's a benefit for making sure that they're healthy so that they overwinter and they increase our chance for overwintering those crowns too. Uh, but that's the removal and that's the cost of business. So is that how much we have to apply every year? Not necessarily. That's where soil tests come in. Let's get good soil tests out there. I really want it soil tested before you establish a stand to make some adjustments because it's easier to make adjustments before you, you get that stand established. But during that, that time period, we can make some decisions how we want to adjust and make changes and add fertility during the season. And a couple, three things about this table. Uh, we had a lot of debate about what this table would look like for, for people to use. This is the final form it took, but let's start on the left-hand side. Let's look at phosphorus. A reminder, alfalfa responds to phosphorus quicker than corn and soybean and other crops. And so if you look at the category definitions, you'll find that for alfalfa or wheat, the optimum category in each of those categories are in a higher range than they are for corn and soybeans. So for corn and soybeans, we consider the optimum range 16 to 20. For phosphorus and alfalfa, 21 to 25. That's assuming you're using a Bray-1 test or Malik 3 P test. Now there are other tests out there that do work and are really good at indicators of where our soil fertility is. So if you get a soil test report back, most come back in a P1 or a P1 equivalent. Sometimes the labs may be even use an amelic three, but they'll say it's a P1 test. By the way, the P2 test, I pretty much ignore because we've never been able to find a good calibration or correlation between yields and what the P2 test says. So I don't look at that one when I'm making a decision where we're gonna use and, and how we're gonna determine for the future. Uh, Malik 3 ICP test has a different way of reading the results. And so it gives you different category numbers. An Olson test is an old test used in high pH soils. Malik tests and Olson tests work with high pH soils when the pH above 7.4. A Bray P1 test isn't very effective between uh, on, on pHs of 7.4 and above. 
So we're not going to say use that during that time period. Uh, but those are the categories for those different phosphorus tests. On the potassium side, it doesn't make a difference which test is used, whether it's ammonium acetate or malic 3. Uh, on the phosphorus side, you can have labs that'll do a moist sample or they'll dry it in the lab before they do an analysis. It doesn't make a difference for phosphorus. On the potassium side, there's some things that happen when we dry those samples at the lab. And so you're gonna see if it's a field moist or a slurry sample in the lab, which most labs do not do, but there are some that do, you'll see that that range for the numbers is different than it is if they dry those samples. A note, and I'm not gonna get into it deeply, but I will tell you that most of our research at Iowa State would indicate we're more consistent on getting yield responses based on the categories when it's a field moist sample versus a dried sample. There's some things that happen when we dry those samples, particularly if we dry them rapidly, that with some of our soils alter what that test says. And so you're gonna see some different numbers on there and the consistency is good on both, but it's better if it's a field moist test. So we have our numbers back. What's our recommendation? If you look at table 10 on that publication, it'll talk about the recommendation for alfalfa based on the soil test categories. And so the optimum category, Iowa State's recommendation is replace what you took off. In the low and very low categories, we're probably going to encourage you to put on a little more than what you're removing so you can build those soil test levels, but you don't have to do that rapidly. It's a very slow build. It's likely gonna give you a response to your investment, but it's a very slow build. It's not a rapid build. You'll see that if our soil test levels are high or very high, we don't have a recommendation for those fertilizers out there. I would argue, particularly for potassium, with the high use that we have on an annual basis, if we start in the middle or lower part of the high range category when we start seeding that crop, we might want to consider by the time we get to year three or four, at least replacing part, if not all of what we're removing, because we're going to drop those soil test levels um, when we take off high amounts of those nutrients. Uh, so keep that in mind. But the need for replacement when we have high and very high soil test levels and getting a yield response is pretty limited. Optimum range, there's a decent chance, but not a great chance of getting a yield response. So if we really have a short cash flow year, maybe we can ride a year or two without putting back what we've got out there, what we removed. But in the low and very low categories, it's gonna cost us money if we're not replacing at least what we're removing, preferably a little bit more. Again, Looking at, and by the way, the optimum recommendation is based on five tons per acre removal. If you're removing more than that or less than that, adjust it accordingly based on that earlier table. And one last note, in the year of seeding, even in the high, very high soil test categories, there seems to be some ability to get a better stand established if the year that we're seeding, we still put on 30 pounds of phosphorus recommended per acre. It seems to create an environment that gives us a little better chance for getting more seeds established per acre, even if soil test levels are fairly high. So I've had people complain to me that says, hey, Iowa State's recommendations are too low. Um, hey, maybe that's true. That's uh, based on research, truthfully, uh, corn and soybean research, we've got more than anywhere in the state as far as research and yield response. Alfalfa, we've got quite a bit of alfalfa yield response for P and K. Uh, it's probably not the newest data in the world. It's, it's probably got a little more age to it a decade or so since we really looked really seriously at P and K responses in multiple locations. But those recommendations are based on research. They're not based on estimates. And so uh, I've often been told it needs to be higher. So one of the things that I really appreciate for Brian Lang as a, and, and Ken Pesanowski at the Northeast Research Farm in Nashua. Uh, in, in, from 2013 to 2015, they looked at uh, looking at a high input alfalfa management program compared to some basic recommendations. And you can kind of see some of the different things they compared here. Uh, we looked at the Iowa State soil fertility recommendation. Uh, the field they looked at was in the optimum category maybe the higher end of the optimum category, but it was in the optimum category. So they use basically a replacement rate of P and K for that field for fertility. 
They also looked at six different treatments where they used 125% of the Iowa State PNK soil fertility recommendation. Uh, all but one of those sites had a foliar insecticide applied after in the regrowth of every cutting. So the first, the first growth did not get it. The first cutting did not have it during the growing season. Uh, it's the second, third, and fourth. This is a four cutting 35 day interval system. Uh, tried to get the last cutting done the first week of September. Uh, they used a foliar insectis, a foliar fertilizer on, on six of the treatments. They used a product called BioForge, which is a product that supposedly gives more um, uh, ability to handle stress. It's got some minor micronutrient applications in it, uh, but it's mostly uh, designed supposedly to reduce the stress. So they used that on a couple treatments. And then on two of the treatments, we used a foliar fungicide uh, with every one of them. And uh, as you can see at the bottom, all the foliar treatments went on for the first cutting at the eight inch canopy, uh, second, third, and fourth, five to six inch canopy is where it went on. So what did they see in the mix? Uh, you know, if you wanna see the data in detail, the Northeast Research Farm Report has it. Uh, a few things, or if you want to copy this presentation, you'll be able to see it also. Uh, but a few things that I'll point out. Number one, uh, middle category, profit per acre over treatment. With those as prices that we have in the bottom, most profitable treatment was the basics, which means, by the way, the insecticide was not applied to the first cutting and was for two, three, and four. So this was Iowa State's soil fertility recommendations with insecticide treatment was the most profitable one. Statistically in the same range as the second one and the seventh and eighth. The second one was basically the same, but it had a foliar fertilizer applied to it also. And seven and eight were the only two that had a fungicide. So those were some of the things we looked at and that gave us some interest in looking further at fungicides, which was a project that continued. Uh, but it also told us if you take a look at uh, uh, choice number five was the only one that did not have an insecticide. And that was also in every year, the lowest yielding in every year. So the insecticide did give us help virtually every year. Now I encourage you, if you wanna spend time on those details, get a copy of it and take a closer look, but I'm gonna borrow the summary out of the Northeast Research Farm annual report uh, that talked about this study. And of the eight treatments, uh, the normal extension soil fertility recommendations provided the most economic advantage. The higher rate didn't give you a yield advantage or at least that paid for it, not, did not provide an economic advantage. They also looked at winter survival and stand injury, uh, didn't see any differences whether it was 100% or 125% of that fertility recommendation. The foliar insecticides gave us some help in virtually every year, not for every cutting. Uh, that's why we still recommend getting your sweep net out, look for potato leaf hoppers on the first cutting, particularly for Southern Iowa, what's alfalfa weevil doing for us. Uh, Northwest Iowa alfalfa weevils during the first cutting rarely cause significant damage, but sometimes come out high enough that it slows regrowth for the second. So scouting, making sure we know what's going on, how rapidly regrowth is going. Those are things we need to keep an eye on. Instead of a prophylactic treatment that occurs with every regrowth, let's take a look at if we have pressure or don't we. A note, and this is probably the only time I'll talk about insecticides, but another note, uh, we see a lot of that insecticide go on shortly after uh, baling is done so that we're not rolling over much alfalfa growth. However, one of the notes for potato leaf hoppers is that potato leaf hoppers, after you cut them, uh, you'll kill quite a few, but a lot of them will also move into, an uh, into a soybean field for a while. Uh, they can use soybeans as a food source, but that's not a great food source. And so as the alfalfa starts growing in cases, many cases, they'll migrate back in. So hopefully your insecticide is still out there. But in reality, a little later timing would actually kill insects, insects better. You might wear over more alfalfa, but if you have a wide boom, it's probably not a very high percentage, but maybe that would give us a better kill. And it gives us a chance to scout and determine whether we really need to make that trip. 
Additionally, that study, uh, that best, high best management practice study, uh, consider foliar fungicide in wetter years. Um, if you can use that decision, uh, that might give us some help. It really favored the first cutting over other crops, uh, but if we have really damp conditions, maybe it makes sense. And this study also didn't show an advantage economically to using a foliar fertilizer or bioforge. Uh, if our soil fertility is managed well, we didn't see that foliar fertilizer response. So as you make your decisions, that's one of the pieces of information that might be helpful to you as you make your management decisions looking at alfalfa. Another soil fertility topic, lime. Uh, alfalfa is one of those crops that responds to uh, higher pH soils more than than other legumes and corn and soybeans. I think most of you recognize ideally, we talk about targeting a pH of 6.9 or the upper sixes uh, for alfalfa production. Uh, this is a really important one to do some soil testing before we establish that crop. That's the best time to make some adjustments, get some lime applications. Uh, Iowa State, that same publication is recommendations for lime applications and so Northeast Iowa, Eastern Iowa, et cetera, uh, we really wanna target a pH of 6.9 that's out there. Of course, our soil test is gonna tell us whether we need to lime or not. Uh, you know, if we get into that mid six range, we probably wanna consider some lime applications as we establish it. Uh, ideally, if we, ideally six, eight, six, nine is where we'd like to be. We could consider some lime applications to get it established. Uh, I think that's helpful. Of course, the soil pH tells us if we need lime, buffer pH tells us how much lime we should apply. And so for example, if I'm doing tillage three inches deep and I had a pH of 6.5 in Northeast Iowa, uh, I'm going to target 6.9 for a target area. I need about 2,600 pounds of effective calcium carbonate equivalent applied per acre to actually meet that recommendation. Uh, of course, Ag lime isn't pure 100% ECCE, so a ton in my part of the state's about 1500 or 1550 ECCE. So uh, to get 2200, I need about a ton and a quarter to get there. To get that with some of the lower ECCE lime, it's probably gonna be uh, a little tougher to, I mean, it's gonna take you more tonnage. So you've gotta do that math. A note, in Western Iowa, uh, calcareous subsoils. We've got a lot of lime through our soils, but we have to move lime a long ways to get to our fields. So a ton of that ag lime in my part of the state costs you 42 to 45 bucks per acre, depending on where you're located. And because we have a lot of lime in the subsoil, we sometimes see that a pH of a, of a 6.5 or a target pH for liming of 6.5 still can give us pretty good success of getting a, a really good yield response. Uh, with that high cost of lime with some producers, we might consider using that as a target pH, but only in this part of the state where we've got calcareous subsoils. Uh, so that's one of those things for Western Iowa that might give us a little different answer than we will see in other parts of the state. Another nutrient that can give us issues, sulfur. Uh, we see some side hills, eroded side hills, lower organic matter. It's not giving off as much sulfur. Those can be areas that can give us some problems too. So we wanna look at sulfur in those side hills. Iowa State has a good recommendation on sulfur. Soil tests really aren't very helpful. Our best thing to do is to do some tissue testing. If we think we have some problems, you see some lighter colored areas and you wanna take a look at them, see if they need sulfur. That six inch clip on about 35 stems at the bud stage, send them to a lab for analysis. If it's lower in 0.23%, we could probably use some sulfur on that soy and that alfalfa field. Uh, if it's a not sandy soil, 20 to 25 pounds is probably where I'd be at. Uh, sandy soils, uh, since sulfur is somewhat water soluble, uh, we probably need a little more for a sandier soil, a true sandy soil, a sandy loam or a sand soil. Uh, we might want that higher level. Uh, that's what we're looking at. The data has really been pretty clear out of Wisconsin, similar to data we've seen in Iowa. Uh, that foliar sample for alfalfa really is pretty effective. We're not as nearly as effective predicting for corn and soybean, but we can predict pretty well for alfalfa. Boron, um, Wisconsin's 
recommendation is what I use and what I think we use in, in Iowa for the most part, even though it's not in that Iowa State publication. Uh, this is what Wisconsin uses. There's been some confirmation in Northeast Iowa saying that these are pretty good categories to take a look at. And so I consider those as, as thoughts for uh, boron recommendations uh, for alfalfa. Back to foliar fungicides. Uh, we had some hint on that data we shared earlier that foliar fungicides is something worth looking at, again, at the Northeast Research Farm. They have the equipment to get that harvest done. I've done some of that work uh, by hand and it doesn't work nearly as well. So I uh, appreciate the work they do in Northeast Iowa to get some of that work done. But that fungicide study uh, that they did uh, for seven years is, I think, very helpful. When I look at alfalfa fields, the disease I see the most is going to be spring black stem, and that's that first cutting, particularly if we have kind of a wet spring and it gets kind of rank in growth. We start losing all those lower leaves. You see the black stems, you see the leaves dropping, um, really can kind of get in our pocketbook from that time period. So uh, sometimes you can see it really early in the season. Later on, with the different environment, different temperatures, we can see some different diseases. Uh, I see downy mildew more frequently along with common leaf spot for later cuttings. Less lepto leaf spot in my part of the world. Uh, not sure I've ever seen much stem phyllium uh, leaf spot, but those are some of the different things that can be out there that you get concerned with. At the research farm in, in Northeast Iowa, they use, they looked at several different products. Uh, approach at that time wasn't labeled for alfalfa. It is labeled now. I looked at the label this week and it is labeled. And these are the other treatments they looked at. And they looked at several different studies to try to learn a few things. So let's kind of rapidly go through some of those results. First study was to take a look at what's the better time, three to four inches or six to eight inches. Well, with fungicides, we're trying to protect growth. So having more growth will give you more protection, you would assume. And the data kind of showed that. If you looked at the data from 2012 and 2013, anytime you looked at three to four versus six to eight, and you looked at the assumed different hay prices, let's check with 140 per ton. Almost every time you saw the most profit or the least loss that occurred with the six to eight inch application height at all four time periods, it was pretty consistent. So that was an indicator that's probably the right time if we're going to look at it, that's maybe the better time to look at those fungicide applications. Secondly, are there differences between varieties? Yeah, we know there's different ratings, so we expect to see differences between varieties. Maybe not as big on the profitability side as perhaps I would have assumed, but we do see some differences out there. So note that better, when we look at the numbers here in a minute, note that there are some differences between the varieties and how it's going to respond. Wet years, 2013, as I look at the next data set, 2013 was a really wet spring, gave us one of the best responses to using fungicide. So that's one thing that I'll put in a note for you. But this is the summary by year and by cutting from the Nashua farm where they looked for seven years, one, two, three, four, five, six years, pardon me, uh, of data where they actually looked at using fungicides with every treatment. And then this one, they targeted the eight inch time period for getting those applications on there. You can look at lots of different information, but I'm going to skip through this. I'll let you come back and look at it later. I really like the table that they put together that took a look at what are the odds that you're gonna get money back from your investment. They were assuming about $15 an acre for the fungicide cost itself and an $8 application cost. So they have a table with the application cost and without the application cost at three different price ranges for, for hay. And if you take a look at $200 a ton hay, even if you charge for the, the fungicide application, we saw fairly really high response to making that investment with the first cutting over that six year time period. $140 a ton, still very high for that first cutting. You'll notice the without is checked off because we don't normally use an insecticide for the first cutting. So somebody's got to pay for that trip. If you're making a trip anyway and throwing in the fungicide, that's the without line for you. 
So I find that really helpful for me. If you can tell me what your hay value is going to be, if it's a top end, it certainly looks like a high percentage of the time. If you're making a trip for insecticide anyway, it makes sense most of the time to use an insect, use a fungicide when it's $200 hay, less responsive at 140, probably a waste of your money at $80 ton hay. Uh, but what's that cost of the application going to be to you? I like that chart for making that decision. So if we're looking at leaf diseases and advice, if leaf disease present and we're seeing significant drop, leaf drop likely, and we're getting pretty big, maybe we move up our cutting time period to try to save some of those leaves and then look at the next generation again. Early and regrowth seeing disease potential and yield potential is good. Maybe a fungicide makes even more sense. Forecast looks to be really wet and we have a yield, good yield coming, especially for that first crop. It makes sense to maybe look at fungicides. All right, how long should we keep that crop? Dan Undersander, Wisconsin. Um, you know, you take a look at this chart, it tells me if we can keep it early in that life span, yields are better. There's certainly part of it. You know, and other thoughts in the mix, it gives us some future control for rotation, for advantage in the corn crop. Uh, we can take nitrogen credits, reduce the risk of pests, lots of things out there. You can move over into newer genetics quicker uh, by lowering that time period. But where are we? This was pretty good management system, four cut system out of Wisconsin. And you put this table together from, by the time we get to year four, we're starting to see it drop off pretty significantly. And this is pretty good management. Some of the things that affect that, of course, are our cutting schedule. And we could spend a lot of time on our cutting schedule and looking at some different things you have to figure out what works in your operation. I kind of like that staggered schedule consideration there because you can't cut every field all at the same time. Uh, do we make a fifth cut? Don't we make a fifth cut? If, uh, if we want to get it persist, I don't like to see that last cut taken after September 5th and North, September 10th in Northern Iowa. But yet I get lots of phone calls the 25th to the 30th of September if the weather's nice. Uh, increases our risk. And that's the hard one. Do we want to take something off with a really late cutting or graze it off later after October 15th, after that frost has really hit it, or we're not going to get much regrowth? You know, I want that eight inch regrowth out there or better if we can to get energy back into the system. I want that eight inch so we can maybe catch some snow to give some winter protection. But if you need the forage, again, take a look at how that fits in your operation. And of course, we're going to have situations that's going to throw us off our schedule anyway. So take a look at all of that. And at the end of the season, if you get questions of where you want to go with that, take a close look at that publication we referred to earlier. One of those things I haven't looked at is low lignin alfalfa. I have no experience in it. I do know that it will maintain its quality longer. So you can maybe get it a little longer before you cut it to get the same amount of quality. Uh, this comes again from Dan Undersander, Wisconsin. If you cut it five days later, you'll get about 14% more yield. But at the same time, you'll have the same quality because it's a low lignin alfalfa. So at some stage, I'd like to hear from some of you that's used that, what you feel, what kind of response you've seen from those, from those varieties. All right, first cutting. We're going to face the first cutting here. Uh, there is a good estimate for trying to match the quality from the first cutting. You know, it gets leggier, it's taller. Uh, we lose lower leaves in many cases, so that's part of the mix. But Iowa State does have a good present, a good uh, a, a peak equation, a predictive equation for alfalfa quality we use with the first cutting. It's a really good publication. It's found on your dairy team website. I'll encourage you to go there. Many of us across the state will be out there monitoring average alfalfa height. So if you go to that website, you can monitor height and we can give you estimates of what the relative feed value is of standing up alpha as we move forward. Uh, but it's based on peak. And where harvest needs to be done needs to be determined based on your forage quality needs of your animals. So I'm gonna do an example here. Let's say we wanna target 150, 155. That's what we want for a relative feed quality for our, for our animals. We can go to that 
publication and based on stage of growth and height of the tallest stem in that given area, we can estimate what the relative feed value is of that hay in the field. So if we are measuring 24 inches and it's in the bud stage where you can see buds, visible buds out there, but no flowers are visible, we have a relative feed value of its stands of about 181, which meets 150. The problem is we have storage loss and harvest loss that comes with it. So if we're looking at that chart, if we're taking it for hay, I take off 25 points if we're taking it for hay, and I'm gonna take off 15 points if we're gonna take it for haylage. So our target's gonna be right here for about 181 or about 24 inch if we wanna to get to 150, 155 for hay, or if we're taking haylage, we're looking at 26, 27 inch alfalfa, the tallest plants in that area to take it off. It's actually pretty good about giving us estimates. Of course, we can never guess how much we're gonna lose in the field before harvest based on rainfall and other things that occur during that time of the year. But to give you an estimate of what that feed quality is gonna be, use the peak data to get there. I find it very useful as we move forward. A note, the relative feed value with average weather conditions by the time we get to the later part of May, we drop about three to five points per day. So if we're close to our target, Note that's your window of opportunity for trying to reach that relative feed value with your hay that you really want. Last topic, I know I'm getting along. Watt was in a field yesterday, 230 acres of alfalfa. It's gonna become corn this year. It's in year four. You would think normally be out there, you stand, you know, from the road looks really nice. You get in there, actually, probably 30 acres, the stand looks okay, but if you split those crowns, the damage is tremendous. They take a lot of forage off that field. They take it as haylage in most cases, but two years ago, we had a really wet summer and they were walk, riding over that field and not monitoring wheel traffic very much. And so they traveled over a fairly high percent of that field with semis harvesting that crop. And those crowns were in really tough shape. So think about wheel traffic. You want longevity, you want yield. It's something to think about. A reminder, this is some Wisconsin research again. And their research where they were running over entire plots. And I can't remember the exact tonnage. It wasn't the highest tonnage in the world, but they were running after that after two days after cutting, it was costing them about 13% yield reduction on the next harvest. As it got bigger and we got five days after cutting, it was a 28% yield loss. So some considerations, no bigger tractors than required and certainly no duels that are out there. Minimize the time from cutting to harvest so you can reduce that yield loss because the crop hasn't grown back all that much. We do that with wide swaths, haylage, baleage, that kind of thing. Reduce trips across the field. Maybe we manage how we travel across the field to reduce the amount of the area that's out there. And then there's some data out of Minnesota with the Biosystems Engineering Group. If we can merge those, you know, we want it wide to dry quicker so we can get that harvest increased. Maybe we see how much we can merge and we do that as early as we possibly can so that we're running over a small area in the field to reduce that risk. All we can do to reduce that wheel traffic, you know, five days after, 28%, that's a bundle. So those are concerns as we move forward. All right, I kind of went through that rapidly. I apologize, I should have prepared this list a little more, but one last thing before I answer questions, reference materials. Uh, again, if you want a copy of this presentation, email me, I'll be glad to send it to you. Here's some reference materials I use. I go to the National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance website. They've got several very cheaply priced publications that are really good references. One I like is the Alfalfa Analyst. I think that's a great one. Uh, the Alfalfa Variety Ratings along with the winter hardiness information. If you're selecting varieties, another magnificent resource for you. Uh, from the American Society of Agronomy, the Alfalfa Management Guide. Uh, I wanted to pull mine out because I use it a lot. And then I realized I lent it to somebody last summer and didn't get it back. So I didn't get to use that for preparing for this presentation. But I really like the alfalfa management guide. 
Uh, that's another good reference. Wisconsin's Team Forage, uh, great website. I go through information there all the time. I often start with Iowa State's information. Uh, quickest way I pick it up is I go to the Iowa Cro Integrated Crop Management News, ICM News, or the ICM blog, use the search engine, look for alfalfa information. You can find many timely articles from previous years and even in the archives that can help answer many questions. And then for the research we talked about, uh, every research farm has an annual research farm report. I went to the Northeast Research and Demonstration Farm website, pulled those slides out for us to use today. Uh, so it's great information for us. So again, if you want that information, please feel free to contact me. That's my email, my email address, jldyoung at iastate.edu. Would appreciate it and I'd be glad to share that. All right. Questions from the group. Joel, thank you very much. We appreciate the uh, <laughs> the information, and I sure hope you don't remember who you lent that publication to. I uh, would feel bad. I, uh, I, I I forgot. I'm going to have to order one. <laughs> I don't remember. Who I, you know, I should be better than that, but uh, I have that tendency to do that. I'll lend out a sweep net occasionally, and I've lost a couple that way. But I still have a few in my my closet, so we're in good okay. shape. Uh, for the folks who do have questions, please go ahead and at the bottom of your uh, list there, uh, you see the chat box. Go ahead and uh, type in your chat and we'll make sure it gets uh, to uh, Joel. Uh, when you were talking about liming alfalfa, uh, I've got this question a couple times. What about gypsum for alfalfa? Well, gypsum, um, you know, it's a, it's a sulfur source more than anything else. It's calcium sulfate. That's what gypsum is. Uh, it does not lower pH. It actually has a little bit of, a, if you look at the chemistry, it actually has a little bit to maybe slightly, uh, pardon me, it doesn't raise pH like lime does. It does have a little bit of ability, but it's limited. Uh, the sulfate in, in the mix. Uh, does have a little bit of ability to to lower pH slightly, but it's not going to be applied at high enough rate to make a difference. But gypsum can be a pretty effective sulfur source. Truthfully, in most silos soils, we have quite a bit of calcium that's out there. Uh, we don't necessarily need the calcium from the gypsum unless you maybe, I, I can't think of a situation where I've ever seen a case where we've seen a calcium respond. Uh, but uh, you know, the sulfur, uh, gypsum as a sulfur source can be a, pos a really positive po option for us for using that for that source. Okay, uh, Travis has put a question into the queue. Uh, planting new seedings, 12 month herbicide restrictions. Do we need to be more careful with dry years like last year? Travis, I hope you got your springs off to a good start. Uh, I've known Travis for a long time, so I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, when we have the first 30 to 60 days after herbicides are applied, uh, if they have soil activity, uh, the first 36, 30 to 60 days, if they're pretty dry, it does slow down uh, the ability for it to break down. So it's, it's half-life. Um, it's half-life can be a, a little elongated for that reason. I would note, however, that um, what's published in the labels typically take dry years into account because you got to remember those labels are for much of the country. We have other parts of the country that are drier than even we are when it's a dry year. Uh, so I would feel if the label says uh, 12 months, Travis, I think we're probably still okay. Okay, we've got a question from Larry. Is high cal lime of high value and uh, uh, care causing rations of the concern um, may make it out to be, many make it out to be? Is high cal lime of high value? Well, um, high calcium lime, calcium carbonate, um, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, uh, it's almost, we have, we have uh, in my part of the world, I don't worry whether it's dolomitic lime or if it's calcium carbonate, ag lime. I, the, the calcium 
magnesium ratios, a dolomitic lime is going to have a little higher content of, of magnesium than the other lime. That's what the definition of dolomitic lime is, the magnesium. Uh, for the most part in this part of the world, in Northwest Iowa, uh, I don't get that concern about needing dolomitic lime because we don't often see the problem that deals with it. Now, you can run into some problems with grazing grasses with grass tetany because of some issues out there. And I have to confess, I've never studied that issue very much in this part of the world because I, I don't get it that often. Uh, so I would encourage you to talk to your beef specialists or you dairy specialists that have some information on the grass tetany and grazing the grasses. I was focusing on alfalfa here today, Larry, so I apologize for that. Uh, in my part of the world, we don't worry about it. Uh, and to get dolomitic lime here in Northwest Iowa, it probably costs us 150 bu 100 bucks a ton just to get it traveled here. And we don't have so much of a problem with it. Some parts of the state, that's a bigger issue, particularly with grasses. On alfalfa, I'm not worried about it. Uh, but for some grasses, that potentially can be an issue. Okay, we've uh, got a question. Can you review uh, at the soil moisture levels? Are they okay for this first cutting? Um, they're okay, Mark. Uh, even in Northwest Iowa, let's see if I can find it for you. Uh, let me sh let me go back here. Here I can share this. I pulled my soil moisture samples and got them out of the got them out of the uh, oven this week. Uh, that's the Northwest Iowa five foot soil moisture samples. The, every one of them was at average or slightly above. One site was an alfalfa site that was in Western Sioux County, uh, along not too far from the South Dakota border. Uh, the numbers without the parentheses so what I measured 15th of April. Uh, the, the drier ones were Osceola and O'Brien counties. Other sites actually, we had two inches or better more precipitation than normal the normal this winter. So much of Northwest Iowa has us at average to, slight, to above average for soil moisture looking into this year. So based on that information, uh, I'm going to say that I think to get that first cutting going, I think we're in pretty good shape as far as moisture goes in most of Northwest Iowa. Okay, we've got a follow-up question on that. What is a strategy if we know uh, we're going into a drought situation for second, third, fourth cuttings. There's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to change my management unless I have irrigation. Then, of course, I'm going to run it more often. But I'm not sure I'm going to change that very much. Uh, one of the things we know that, uh, you know, we've seen cases in Northwest Iowa where we get in the middle of the summer we know where alfalfa originated from. It was the Middle East. And so what we see happen is, and I'll get questions, and it's not uncommon on a really dry summer that our alfalfa in parts of the field will go dormant. Even new seedings will go dormant middle of the summer. And I'll get the question, is it dead? Uh, you give me rainfall, it recovers. Uh, dry falls actually have a tendency to allow better overwintering. If, if you know, it's plenty of water creates a bigger overwintering risk than, than not much water. So I don't think I'm going to change it much, except that I might consider lengthening my time frame between cuttings so that I am protecting those plants for longevity, if that's what my goal is. Uh, that would be my only comment for you on that side, Fred. Okay. You can disagree with me, and I'd welcome discussion on that if you wish. Okay, we've got one question left, uh, but before I get to that, I'd like to ask everybody to uh, take the short survey that's on the uh, uh, chat box there. Just uh, go ahead and copy it and put, paste it and open it up. Uh, you know, that helps us know what we've done right and what we have to change. So going back to the last question I have in the queue, uh, kind of going back to soil temperatures, uh, what's the concern we have to have for soil temperatures because of this uh, temperatures we've had the last week? 
Well, for Travis, for putting the seed in the ground, I'm not worried about the temperature for putting alfalfa seed in the ground at this stage. It, it, it actually tolerates those lower temperatures better. I think you re recognize that. Um, I'm, you know, for the frost and the cold temperatures we've had, I'm only concerned right now if, um, uh, if we had those new seedings that were already emerged when we got these cold temperatures. If you planted something earlier and we got it above the ground, and then we frosted it off the last two or three nights. Uh, that's not coming back. The other established stands, they're going to come back. I'm really confident about that. We might lose some tissue. Uh, but if something's emerged right now, I think we've got some potential problem with, with not having plants uh, survive that because that growing point is above ground at this stage and we haven't formed that crown yet for regrowth of tissue. So if it was emerged, I think we lost that stand and we're gonna to have to reseed. But uh, as far as the temperature right now, I'm gonna play with the average and say, even if we are cooler, I don't think we're gonna have very many more chances. If you see now that you're gonna have any problems uh, with it freezing off later, there's always exceptions to that rule, but I think it's time to get that seed in the ground, make sure that ground's really firm. So when we get those dry, windy weather situations, we don't dry out to the seed because that's that's our biggest stand loss, in my opinion, is not firm enough seed beds. Uh, but I think it's time to get that seed in the ground right now. Joel, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm going to play auctioneer going, going, gone. I don't see any other questions coming in uh, so again, uh, thank everybody for uh, participating with our, our monthly webinar and thank uh, Joel DeYoung, our local agronomist for presenting the information uh, to us. Uh, we'll talk with everybody next month.